All right, Francesco. Good morning, America. Good afternoon, Europe, and good evening, Asia. I have the honor of being here with uh, my esteemed colleague, Peg Hurley Dawson, PhD. Welcome to the podcast, Peg. Thank you, Francesco. It's a pleasure lovely to, to be see here. You. Yeah, lovely Thanks. to see you. So I want to go quickly through your bio. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Peg Hurley Dawson, PhD, uh, is a counselor. She specializes in the treatment of sex and relationship issues, sex addiction, out of control sexual behavior, complex trauma, PTSD, sexual pain, mismatch desire, gender identity, and non-traditional relationships. And she indeed works uh, with LGBTQI and A. She utilizes the following modalities, uh, EMDR, IFS, clinical hypnosis, sensory motor psychotherapy, some play, some tray. Um, and I'm ending with that, uh, this short version of your uh, very engaging bio, uh, because you've recently wrote a book about some play. Yeah, well, it's actually sand play, sand tray are two different things. But I wrote the name of the book is Sand Therapy for Out of Control Sexual Behavior, Shame and Trauma, Treatment Beyond Words. It should be out in the fall of 2023. Maybe soon we'll in the summer. Yeah. So we can have another podcast, if you like, uh, to celebrate uh, its arrival. In That'd the be fall. great. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> so... Um, you are a sex therapist, amongst other things. Um, so why don't we start from what is sex and why it is important? Uh, given that in the Middle Ages, in the West, Christian West, a lot of people thought that it was something dirty. A lot of people uh, were religious people, monks, priests, nuns. And these days, a lot of people stop having sex or decide to choose a, a spiritual, religious lifestyle where uh, one is told you can sublimate sexual energies into pray, meditation. Is that just for addicts, uh, sex? I personally don't think so, but uh, I... I would like us, I would like you to illustrate what is it and why it is important. Okay, great question. Thank you. So there's lots of reasons why people have different thoughts about sex or how they may view it. And, um, and nothing is the exact right answer. Everybody has their own way of being with their sexual energy or in general with sexuality. So... Mm -hmm. Big question you ask, and we'll try to break it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So this idea that sex is dirty, or many people may still believe that, and and that may be true for them. But it, really what's happening in the field of sexuality and field of sex therapy is that people are beginning to understand that the idea of sex is really more about what is safe, sane, consensual, and that's in the BDSM community, which is bondage, discipline, sadomasochism, which is mm -hmm. a, kind of a, a, a way of being sexual in a, in a way that, but mostly I think this idea of consent is hugely important. And mm -hmm. that's important because we want both parties be able to enjoy what they're about to negotiate or agree upon or what they're going to do. So that's mm -hmm. important. Other aspects of sexuality might be viewed in different ways by different people and there's all there's different ways of being sexual so some mm -hmm. people think you know penis vagina sex is the only way that it can be but there's other things like even in um different communities especially maybe gay communicate gay men may actually not have penetration at all there's a mm -hmm. colleague of mine dr joe court he's out in michigan uh talks about being sides and that's with no penetration. That's about having sexual intimacy in a different way. 
And then mm-hmm. this idea of sexual intimacy could be broken down to what is sexual intimacy? So is sexual intimacy having intercourse or is sexual intimacy about touch and engagement and enjoying each other in a different way? And mm-hmm. so there's, there's that aspect. So it's like a big umbrella, the idea of sex. And then we have little sub things and subheadings of that. So it can be a kink community, BDSM. It could be um, a fetish community mm-hmm. or something too. And, or it could be anything, whether it's intimacy, penis, vagina, sex, or whatever you want to think about could be sexual is really in the, in the, whoever can think about whatever they want to do, as long as in my book, as long as it's consensual and mm-hmm. both parties can engage and the, and some people say that it depends on what the age of consent is, wherever mm-hmm. the, somebody is located in the world. And, um, I think that's kind of it. Did that answer some of the question or did I leave something out? Is there any more questions about that? I'm sure there are. Um, That's a very, it's a very good uh, introduction. And like you're saying, one could expand uh, (laughs) further, but it's a fantastic start. Um, uh, There are parts of the world where Arranged marriage still exists uh, and is prominent mm-hmm. and is accepted. Mm-hmm. I was in India two years ago and younger generations, uh, uh, some of the younger generations, particularly from the upper class, are uh, uh, after just one generation of choosing love marriage, they are restarting to choose arranged marriage. In, in that setup, um, you're marrying somebody that you don't even know if you... Um, are, are gonna enjoy sex with um, but you choose to make it work it's a completely different ball game for us westerners I that's very alien to me I, it's, I don't feel competent to uh, discuss it and it would be unfair to put you on the spot uh, I guess to discuss it but I, I, I'm only bringing it to your attention uh, because um Given that, uh, and given that the West also went for arranged marriage for centuries, it's not like we didn't do it in the West. Um, so this idea of choice, uh, <laughs> I choose the person that I find attractive. I date that person. If I fall in love, I may commit to that person on a, in a monogamous relationship or in a different type or sexual Mm -hmm. style. And then sex at any given point in this relationship with this person that you first met uh, uh, enters in different cultures and in different contexts. It enters sometimes very early in the first meeting, sometimes after marriage. Um, So after this acknowledgement of the cultural uh, aspects, brief acknowledgement. So what does it do? Once he entered the relationship, uh, what does it do? Does it complement the relationship? Or is it plausible to think that actually a relationship could even start with sex? Are there any rules there as far as you're concerned? I think, rules. I think the culture makes kind of a rule. The culture says we're going to have an arranged marriage or the culture says you know, choose who you want to love and be intimate with whoever you want to be or have sex with whoever you want to be, if that's the culture. And Mm -hmm. um, times the the idea of a non-traditional relationship has really blown up. It's like becoming a, a, a big thing or it has been a big thing. And many people haven't talked about that. So, you know, how do we be in a non-traditional relationship versus a traditional relationship? And Mm -hmm. it's kind of culturally based on what is, what they, what people believe that to be. So, you know, Timmy Nelson, Dr. Timmy Nelson here in uh, the States has written books about non-monogamy and many other people have in addition, but T- Timmy does a great job of really mm. reaching the, the population that really talks about non-traditional relationships. So non-traditional relationship, again, is a big umbrella because we might have polyamorous people in relationship. We might have people going outside their marriage consensually or even together, or having a third party join, or whatever the, it looks like. It could look like um, 
you know, um, in my practice, we have people that come and they want to open their relationship. They have a very traditional relationship. And to, even when I say traditional, that can bring up all kinds of concepts of what, what's traditional to me or to them may be entirely different. And what your viewers in different countries may find traditional or non-traditional to mean is kind of, we have to look into, I always ask the client, what does that mean to you? Mm. And it's really about finding out what some word or even sexual, what does sex mean to you? What does sexual intimacy mean to you? What does that mean to you? and to, to your partner. And we talk about all that because the, to have a fundamental, it's like a fundamental um, place to start is what does it mean to the other? And we really have to work around that mm-hmm. before we can really engage in understanding what the concept is for them. And so I understand their concept of this. Does that make sense? Yes, it's a very person centered. It means different things to different individuals and cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's your understanding of what sex gives, uh, gifts a relationship, adds to a loving relationship or not necessarily loving relationship, actually, to any saying, relationship? That's right. <laughs> so we have, so different people believe different things. And again, we have to ask the individual. But um, my understanding is going to be different than the next person's. But we want to look at the possibilities of maybe we want to have sex and just have a one night stand. And that's pretty okay. As long as it's consenting and, and is it, or do we want to have a different type of intimacy, through sexuality or through sex or having uh, an intimate sexual experience where you both um, want in a certain way and it might be discussed and, you know, the different communities have this idea of we discuss what's going to happen like in, in a sexual play community or swingers have their way of thinking about this and um the king community has their way of talking about it and it really depends on how how you're going to talk about or be with the partner and many times we want to think about there's a partner are we really open to the partner's no are we really open to what that means for the partner to have limitations are we thinking about diversity of the people who have uh, physical disabilities and how and how they want to be intimate or, or or not, right? What feels right to the other and how do we negotiate that? I think it really is about a conversation first. And we, we, we talk about the intimacy and maybe intimacy means something different to everybody else. So we might even have a conversation with our partner or the people we're, we're engaging in is what does this mean to you to have a relationship with me or a sexual intimacy with me or a one night stand or maybe a three night stand? So whatever it's going to be, right? So I'm wondering if that answers your question. It answers a lot of questions. Thank you. Welcome. (laughs) Um, So I work with couples uh, and uh, so I'm I'm in the business and, and so do you. Uh, so I feel I'm in the business of relationships and sex, intimacy. Uh, I think uh, in the US you use sex uh, for, and in the in the UK perhaps intimacy, but they are interchangeable. If we are, uh, what you, the way you use sex is almost identical to the way intimacy is used in the UK, I believe. So I'm going to use them interchangeable, interchangeably. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, in a relationship, uh, uh, in the sex is comes as a part of it, uh, um, and in, a relationship is not necessarily about pleasure. A relationship is uh, is about pleasure and pain because every couple goes through a crisis at some point or another. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost mathematical, I feel. And uh, it's almost like sometimes you, if you, if you have had the, 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 uh, you've been fortunate to have some crisis earlier on in the relationship and learn from it, if it doesn't uh, very much affect the relationship, um, Otherwise, you're bound to have a crisis at 
at one point, at a later point, and of course, some couples are bound to have less impactful crises. But uh, all I'm trying to say is that I feel that uh, relationships and pleasure are two different things. If anything, in relationship, there is a lot of, uh, I find, a lot of uh, challenges to overcome. Whereas with sex, um, one could be mistakenly assumed that it's about pleasure. It's and, not always about pleasure. Right. That's that's what I wanted to ask you. What else it is about? Well, I think it's about, it can be used for a lot of things, right? Um, I notice in, uh, I specialize with this idea of out of control sexual behavior or problematic sexual behavior and some people call it sex addiction, and I put that in quotes because I don't believe you can be addicted to sex. I believe it's a dysregulation issue. So in that realm, we talk about, I see a lot of people with that dysregulation issue that I call out of control sexual behavior or problematic sexual behavior. And that's a lot of what the book is that, that I wrote is about. So is so that may know these people that are struggling with this behavior sometimes feel, you know, I have to say, this is a problem for you. And it might be a problem and painful for their partner. So that could become the very painful issue you're talking about, along with other things. So if it's not, and so it's more, I find it's more about regulation than it is about pleasure. And not necessarily everybody who's regulating by having an orgasm is experiencing, they may experience some moments of pleasure, but overall the, the pain of hurting their partner or saying, I would never do this again. And then doing it is, can be very painful. And then you talk about other types of pain in relationships. And is it, it's the emotional pain or the physical pain that I wanted to ask you, are you saying more emotional pain causing just something happening negatively? Mm, with the yeah. Okay. So I was referring to emotional pain mostly. Yes. Yeah. Because I see people that have physical pain with sex. And right. many times it's, it's something, you know, they can't find, um, um, I'm thinking of a particular client who the gynecologist said, you'll never have penetrative sex again. And yet I saw this person who's a female and she, after 11 sessions was able to have penetrative sex again. And it was pleasurable for her. It wasn't painful where sex was painful before. Right. So mm -hmm. many, many different types of pain and, so uh, the emotional pain can cause the sexual not to be pleasure, right? Emotional pain can cause, I don't want to have this with you. I don't want to connect with you. And so there's other aspects too that are really about how do we negotiate this in a relationship where some people may not feel they can speak up or they, and they end up having sex in a way that they, you know, they can have an orgasm, but maybe it's not pleasurable. I mean, they can have an orgasm and feel moments of pleasure, but might be something that is not really what they wanted to do. The physical body can take over and feel, have an orgasm, but it's not necessarily an emotional connection, right? So just mm. because the body's having an orgasm doesn't mean it's a physiological response, maybe not an emotional response. Thank you. Um... So I noticed that uh, from your answers that, and it doesn't surprise me that it's a very personal thing and what it does to a relationship is is very personal. And, uh, and also some people are more fortunate than others to, uh, to be able to straightforwardly enjoy, and I'm using the word enjoy again, Whereas actually you've just said regulation is what makes sex most beneficial, I guess. I think it, I have to have more clarity on that then because it's not about regulation makes good sex. I'm saying some people use sex to regulate. Mm -hmm. right? It's very different than having sexual a sexual experience where it's not about that at all. That may be one whole separate thing. That's one of the things under the umbrella, the huge umbrella. Uh, so what I'm saying 
is that when there's a consensus that we're going to do it in, we're going to have an intimacy or a sexual experience or whatever it's going to be. Um, and we both understand what we're getting from it, or we, we agree that we're going to have sex just for, to have orgasms or just to get off. Right. That's a very different experience than, you know, oh, we're going to go out for this beautiful dinner. We're going to have this lovely connection and we're going to have this beautiful making love moment after dinner. We're going to go home, light the fireplace, put candles and just have this moment of whatever it's going to be. Or some people would go to dinner, have the lovely dinner and say, let's go home and talk about being caned and how are we going to negotiate that scene? What's mm-hmm. going to happen there, right? And that can be very pleasurable, even though there's p- physical pain, but the physical pain can be the desired like and the desired moment for the huge sensations of what that causes for that person Mm. so this so it's not an easy answer when you think about all the different ways people engage in in sexual behavior or sexual pleasure or sexual kinks or whatever they're going to do right and it's usually best if it's really consensual i keep bringing that up is it really mm-hmm. feels important to me? And in couples, if there's a di- sometimes if there's an emotional disconnection, mm-hmm. then the intimacy or the the sexual pleasure may not be in the re- you know. Although I'm, I'm contradicting myself because mm-hmm. in, sometimes uh, sex after an argument can be the most hot sex you ever have, right? So there's mm. all kinds of way to negotiate this. And it's pretty exciting when you think of all the possibilities. Yes. And when you say consent, mm. uh, it also conjures up for me um, good communication and uh, negotiating beforehand. What type of sex would you like to have? Uh, and what type of sex I would like to have? Um, I feel that newer generations um being educated to do this more uh well we hope so we hope and uh yes uh i mean the landscape it's it's difficult to forecast how things are gonna unfold but uh this particular aspects uh, i can see a, a lot of positives like you're saying you're not gonna you're less likely to feel disappointed and uh, in all sort of ways, I mean, one of the most traumatic ways to be disappointed after sex is I thought it was going to be romantic and I felt uh, like objectified instead. Oh, this happens all the time, as you know, as a couple of therapists that deals with sexual mm-hmm. communication or miscommunication, right? Yeah. So it seems implicit in what you're saying that uh, um, negotiating it. Even even in a long term relationship, uh, maybe we shouldn't take things for granted. Um, uh, I agree. Mm. I agree, especially in long term relationships. Especially, we think we know the other, and do mm-hmm. we really? Do we really check in after a period of time? Do we check in and say, "How is sex going for us? How's it going for you? What do you like or dislike what I do?" And can the, a person even say that? And accept the critique or the feedback. And how do you say to somebody, you know, really don't like the way you do this. And and maybe the other person can't handle that. Maybe they could, we don't know. So we have to negotiate maybe even that. Like, how can we talk about what is working and what isn't working? And how do we navigate that? And how do the couples or even the poly quad or family or whatever's happening how do we negotiate being able to be honest and also the the tenderness that's needed to discuss these very difficult conversations? Often people don't do them. Often people don't connect in the way that says, I really need to have a very kind of intimate conversation with you that may be difficult, you know, this People come to therapy to have that conversation and they need somebody to navigate it with them. And that's often where sex therapy, one aspect of sex therapy and counseling can be really helpful to negotiate these things. 
we could take this conversation in many directions uh, at this well, point, I feel, and I'm really thoroughly enjoying uh, uh, the breadth of your experience. Um, when you said, uh, how in a, in a long-term relationship, how is our sex life going? Checking in with one another. Um, I'm going to throw in Petrarchy. <laughs> what are you going to throw in what? I love this one. <laughs> um, yes. So, um, so recently I um, interviewed uh, three women from my mother's generation. So late 70s. Yeah, late 70s. Uh, late 70s, based yeah. in Italy and the UK. And I was expecting them to say, I felt obliged to uh have sex with my husband it wasn't just an option for me to say no uh and they kind of said that but they also said which surprised me that uh they uh, didn't mind too much his lack of empathy his poor communication skills and the fact that sometimes he was expecting sex not realizing that for her he was going through the motions uh, mm -hmm. that particular night or that particular year, maybe. Yeah. Because I loved him and, uh, and, and, and so I see, and I wonder what you think about this. I mean, there are so many aspects I, and, I, and, I, and I didn't interview a, a big enough sample at all for me to Did generalize. Just three people? Yes, but um, it's great. You're doing the you're asking the questions. I'm asking the questions. Obviously, I have a, a larger samples of people in women of that age that I didn't formally interview, and uh, so I have a, I have a, an approximate idea of uh, of women in that generation in in the West, and but and I'm sure it varies across the board and across countries and individuals and uh, different families. Uh, you had a more positive or less positive experience. However, what do you make of some women like these three that I interviewed that uh, um, say they don't understand uh, younger women giving a hard time to men and, mm -hmm. and struggling to be happy? Because uh, mm -hmm. what I got from them is Yes, he wasn't a great communicator at all. Yes, sometimes I had sex, but uh, I wasn't in love anymore. But I, I, but I, I loved him. And out of affection, I wanted to keep the marriage alive. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question, right? And you interview three people and you probably have a bigger sampling that you you know about, and that's why you came up with the question, right? And to even ask. So there's lots, again, there's lots of way to handle this and answer this. And so as I step back for a moment, I think about your question. And I think that a lot of women, you know, 70 and above, um, mm -hmm. really don't understand maybe the, the people you're talking about these and you the people you're talking about are all saying well i don't understand the new generation of how they want this way and that way and and these new women want to have um you said sex in a different way uh, you these women thought the new women were the younger women were doing what again um, it's about communication and intimacy, really. Um, okay. uh, intimacy stops uh, until and unless the man raises, steps up his game as a communicator and makes her feel more appreciated, loved, understood and heard. I mean, if you ask me as a therapist, I'll tell you this, we need that, like the oxygen. But... Uh, um, I also know as a therapist, as a relationship therapist, that uh, when intimacy is, it's not just intimacy, I'm not suggesting that intimacy shouldn't stop, uh, but when the atmosphere deteriorates, yeah. uh, things can only get worse. And uh, um, so um, 
you know, it, it's almost like um, it's a control. It's a sometimes it could become some sort of an unconscious power game. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna, you know, you're not gonna have sex until. Uh, you do what I want. Uh, that's yeah. not what I mean, really. But no, I a lot hear of... you. I hear you. So what I want to say to this is, again, many, many, many answers. And I wonder, I'm going to do this through a wondering lens. And I wonder if these women in the 70s and older uh, stayed in the marriage, why they, what, you know, they didn't really, they say, oh, we had sex for maybe a year or one time or a month or whatever it is. And I didn't always feel the feel he got me or that he, he was, I didn't really have the pleasure in the moment. I, but I had sex anyways. Right. So mm. in that kind of what I wonder about women who uh, do that and kind of have sex and to keep the marriage alive or to keep the husband happy and you know, okay. But is it because it was it because of was it because maybe they didn't have they couldn't afford to leave the marriage? So they stay with this person who really kind of doesn't get their emotional need or their sexual mm. needs, but really they stay. I wonder they and they want to maybe stay for the family, stay for the kids. And I'm not saying they should just they should leave. But I'm also wondering about why didn't they, why couldn't they say to their partner, you know, listen, this is really, I'm not enjoying this as much as I could. And um, I'm just going to, we're going to, if I wonder if the partner would even be able to hear that, or would they be afraid to tell their partner, yeah. well, you know, it wasn't pleasurable for me. And I would like to do it a little differently next time. Maybe the partner couldn't hear it and the woman didn't feel safe enough to say it, or they just felt their role was to keep the marriage together and have sex when they necessarily didn't want it. And I think the younger connection, younger people or the, the generations after, you know, mm. the 20s, 30s um, generations are more apt to have experience more partners maybe before they partner or if they haven't they they may do the same as the older generation they may not but is it in the experience of learning how to be individuated be your own person and have the other person be their own person and both of you are able to experience it and experience communication and and intimacy and all of this in a different way but i think the I think the lack of communication and wanting to just make the marriage happy, there's lots of, I think there's lots of people that do that. And maybe they're women, maybe they're the men, you know, and um, mm. some of the relationships I've seen where the men want to keep their women happy and they allow their women, they well, don't allow, but they say, sure, you can have sex with someone else or you can do this or that. But, you know, I want to stay committed to you in a different way. So that could be true too. And I've seen it in mm. my office. Right? So there's so many ways. It's such a big umbrella. And we would have to open up conversations. One hour could be we're just on one type of. So you're asking a great question. Yes. And, but notice there's so many answers to this. We would have to subdivide it and approach one answer at a time. I hope yes. That's yes. Um what comes up for me now is like that uh, people from previous generation in the West, uh, including in this case, in the conversation, women from the, who are now in the 70s or 80s, um, they were devoted to monogamy. So yeah. I, I guess to their eyes, the young, they, they don't understand or they disagree with the younger generation because it's like, if you believe in monogamy, then uh, you, you shouldn't label it as a crisis uh, the moment that something doesn't go your way mm -hmm. and, and then give the other person a hard time. And when you give the other person a hard time, he's not going to, not just he or she, whoever starts it, um, are not going to be the best versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but if your religion is not monogamy, <laughs> your devotion is not to monogamy, then 
then I can see the younger generation point of view more. Uh, but one thing that does sadden me is that um, they don't get each other uh, um, because, uh, yeah, the, the, the older generations maybe doesn't get the younger one. And the younger one think, oh, my mother was incredibly unhappy. And when you talk to these people, they don't sound like they were incredibly unhappy. But what I'm learning from you is that they didn't, uh, maybe they didn't know that they could be happier, particularly in the sex realm, right? Um, maybe you can illuminate us here a little I, bit. I'm so actually that... sitting here thinking of, you know, do you know Esther Peral, right? It's yes, of course. Those, of course, right? And what does she say? I think she she says, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but she says, we used to marry for to be happy. Now we divorce to be happier, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not saying that what I'm thinking about is that the older generations maybe stayed um, through thick and thin, through all of that. But the younger mm -hmm. generation is like, I have the women are marrying later, men are marrying later, partnering later, and in life and, you know, younger, older generations, they were married probably by 23, 24. Because and we used to be dead at you know, generations and generations ago, we would die at 35, 40. So we mm -hmm. had to partner and we would partner for life. Then we had needed people to do the farm, right? We need children to survive, but a lot of them didn't survive. So they had big families and all that. And then I think about the, now we have less, less of that. We don't need people to survive, to um, go to the fields, but I'm really thinking about the younger generations that marry later, partner later, and then kind of don't want to have children until they experience their own careers, their own life. And, mm. and isn't it funny how all of that isn't contributing to them wanting their pleasure or they want it, they want to express themselves, or they want, they want to be thought of, I want you to take me as I am. And it's not about, I want you to take me so I can, you know, um, just be married to somebody for security. I can own my own security. I can do my mm -hmm. own. I can make my own money. I can fry it up in a pan, right? <laughs> I can feed the, I can feed my kids. I can do whatever I want. So the, the generations are changing. The dynamics are changing. And we, we, you know, that's, that's what's happened. And is it always necessarily the best? I wonder when we see so many children of, 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 uh, dis, dysregulated parents that end up in divorce and I'm not saying divorce is bad, but I am saying, I wonder about, is it better now than late before? I don't know. I sort of know, but I think that we have to navigate this as, as any culture, you know, when you have arranged marriages, they tend to stay together through thick and thin, but I wonder, do they also have great sex or do they even have sex? And is it for sex? Is it sex that we do it in a different way? What What's going on? Do you know, we really have to get to the intimacy or the, the in the inner dynamics of each relationship, whether you're in your 70s, 60s, 50s, 30s, 20s, whatever. And are you in arranged marriage? Are you in a some kind of relationship that has a different dynamic, whether you're with one partner or more, or all of this is factors. So it's a very interesting question that you, you know, this idea is the 70 year olds different or what they don't understand with this or that, or the younger don't understand the seventies, but it makes, it's just really fascinating. I love the question. I think there's so many answers to it. Mm. <laughs> Indeed, uh, we reached in the last 10 minutes of, of the episode. Okay. Yep. Um, um, what comes up for me is I became a therapist mostly because uh, I, I feel like I'm a sensitive soul and I uh, suffered a lot in my teens, 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, and so uh, I became an expert of predicting that things can go wrong and preventing them to go wrong. And, and so I realized this uh, helped me to be a good therapist uh, because I help couples uh, 
preventing the, something that was so traumatizing for them happens again and it could wreck their marriage if it was to happen again or their relationship. But anyway, because I, I was reflecting, I, I looked at all the problematic aspects of sex in these interviews so far. So maybe in the last, because that's my nature, looking at problems so that we can understand them, prevent them. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so why don't we look at the most beautiful part of sex and what it adds to uh, people's lives in this final part? Ah, the beauty, right? Mm. So I'm actually, I love, I, I want to answer that question, but I also want to say, finally, uh, uh, not finally, but what I'd love to address or say is when people have the most exciting, stimulating adventures with each other and, and whether it includes sex or no sex or whatever they want to be in couplehood that works. What I find when people, when couples into my office, I say, we really have to look at how what's bringing you into the office is your partners are triggering yourselves, right? You're triggered from your partner, your partner's triggered from you and you're, you're in here for a reason. And so mm. I wonder, and when I, I wonder with them, I said, I, I wonder partner A or partner B, what is the, part, the opposite partner? What is, partner A, what's in B and partner B, what's in an A that really is triggering you? And if you do the, if you really look into the U-turn or the idea of, what is it in me that is triggered that I'm getting triggered by my partner that's causing this very issue? And what I mm. find is that what's treat when we look at our partner and we then look at ourselves about why we're triggered about our partner that's creating mm. the problem. If we do the U-turn into our own being, we can find out more about ourselves and how that trigger is really something inside me that needs to be healed. Sure. So when when we when I work with couples and and we both we all three of us or they do what I ask them to do and really look inside themselves, how they heal is recognizing in themselves how they have the issue, and the partner seems to trigger that issue in them. So when you're mm -hmm. able to heal the each person individually, they see each other differently in a different lens, and then mm -hmm. it becomes a pleasurable way of being with each other. So. I think the pleasure actually starts with the individual looking inside them of what the problem is and what, what's happening in them that their partner is raising an issue for them. So when they heal that, and you can do that in partnership in, in your couple's sessions, when that happens, the dynamic of what happens sexually between them, what happens emotionally between them, all of that creates an incredible new relationship. And that is the, it's, mm. it's what you've learned from before, finding how you're triggered from it in the problem, and then coming out of it on the other side, learning how you were triggered, then your partner doesn't trigger you anymore. And then you end up having a much better total relationship. So the, in the sex is just an outcome of that. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, 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 I love what you're saying. And uh, it seems to speak to my initial question about is sex about pleasure not um, always uh, yes your answer was not always uh, uh sex happens as a uh, it falls into place beautifully and deeply when other things are walked through uh, specifically you were saying taking responsibility looking into yourself and realizing you are triggering that that in myself because I have an issue with this particular thing already historically yeah. and we love people taking responsibilities I mean I feel that that's very much what love is or, or part big part of what love is uh, I will take responsibility for my own issues uh, before I start blaming you for for them. Well, that it, what you're doing is what's triggering me, which is my issue. I need to look inside me to find out why I'm getting triggered by what you're doing. And often, you know, the Imago, right? We all marry somebody or partner with somebody that's going to, as Dick Schwartz from Internal Family Systems says, our tour mentor, they're going to torment us, but mentor us at the same time. And we have to look inside us to find out 
What did I need mentoring in? And often it comes from early childhood experiences, frequently, right? So what has happened to me that I don't remember in my implicit memory, my left brain, my conscious memory doesn't recall, but my implicit memory is being triggered by the other. And that creates a problem. And then they end up in our offices. And it's all good because we, when we learn what's happening within ourselves, I mean, as, as anybody, clinician, client, doesn't matter as a human being, when we learn that about ourselves at such a deep level, we become intimate with ourselves so we can allow intimacy with the other, right? And you mm. have to know yourself. And if you don't, you know, that's, that's part of the issue. <laughs> So yeah, it can be amazing. And, and intimacy, sex, the whole bit is really about how to know yourself and love yourself in, in a way that the other doesn't bother you because you've got that covered in yourself. And then you can have sex with pleasure or not with pleasure, with pain, with whatever you want, the type of sex you want to have. And you can have it incredibly intimately too. But you can have the mm -hmm. wide variety, the whole umbrella. I love that we're ending on that note. I, 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 I love that expression, being intimate. Once you learn how to be intimate with yourself, you can be intimate with the other person. It, it just speaks to what intimacy is. It's, it's not, it's, it's that closeness, it's that uh, um, mm -hmm. compassion, self-love. Uh, yeah, I agree, exactly. Right. And if we have our love for ourselves wholly, right, if we know who we are, we can then be with somebody in their whole self. Mm -hmm. The other has to do the work too. So I think this speaks to your 70 year olds or 80 year olds. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and even the it younger. Does. Thank you so much for your time, Peg. Oh, welcome. It was really a pleasure. So enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I look forward to our next chat. Me too. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.